afternoon, everybody. We can uh, get rolling here. I hope these mics are working. Again, we need taller uh, podiums here, Dave. <laughs> hold, hold the microphone. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out on such a beautiful Michigan day. <laughs> we thank the Lukers for coming up here today. Coming up all the way from Texas. Thank you so much. And of course, Carl and Carolyn and everybody and all of you. We appreciate so much your being here. Well, I've been told I'm supposed to just give a brief update, so that's what I'm going to do on the legal side of things. My name is David Coleman. I'm the attorney. Stephen Coleman is here. Jack Jordan is our legal team. We're here for Carl. Um, just to let you know, we filed this morning in Shiawassee County Circuit Court an emergency appeal of his license suspension that he was served with last Thursday night. And we're asking Judge Stewart to sign uh, a stay of that order that says Carl cannot practice as a barber. So we're waiting right now to hear from the judge as to what he's going to do with that request. We also filed in the Court of Appeals at noontime a brief in response to the Attorney General's office is appealing Judge Stewart's ruling from last Monday. And uh, that's in an emergency hearing level in the Court of Appeals. So we filed there this, this noontime. So needless to say, we had a very busy weekend <laughs> and a busy day today. And we're going to keep fighting, and I know because Carl wants to keep fighting, and he's oh, yeah. going to do what he needs to do. So, again, we appreciate you all being here, and I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Dave, I think, uh, Shelly, are you speaking next? Carl. 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 All right, Carl, all right. come on up. Yeah. We love you, Carl. Love you, guys. I love all of you. You know, I'll tell you something, and I've talked about this before. Two weeks ago, I walked into that barbershop alone, you know, and, and the impetus that was behind me was fear mixed with courage, mixed with fear, mixed with courage. And when I finally walked through that door, I had the courage to put the fear away. Woo! There's that old serenity prayer that's been very important to me for very many years. And I'm going to give you that prayer because it goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. But courage to change those things that I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. I know there's people in here that are reciting that along with me. Thank you. But you know, that, 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 that first day I opened up, I knew it was going to be okay. I knew that regardless of what happened, I was standing on the right side of myself and my Creator and you. Yeah. You know, uh, the second day I recall, and I, uh, there was a big, tall deputy sheriff standing directly behind me. You know, he walked into my barber shop. I didn't see him when he came in, and I thought, oh, oh this is over with. <laughs> that, that big guy says, Carl, look at me. And I turned and looked at him. He says, I love you. Yeah. And he turned around and he walked out. <laughs> this was the beginning of that kite, of that hope that I had and the encouragement that I, you know, each person that called me, each person that came in my shop, each person that it encouraged me, encouraged me. It's sort of like I'm, I'm going to swing and twist in the wind, you know, alone sooner or later with this. If I go to jail, I'll be sitting there alone. She can tell you about that. But you, you'll sit there alone. You won't want me sitting with you. <laughs> you will be. You. I'll sit with you. You will be. You will be because I know now, you know, that the, on the right side, the spirit, we all have the same spirit. Yes. We have a spirit and the same soul, you know, for freedom. Yeah. You know, this is the type of, of tyranny that our governments have. It's like, the, you know, it's like this tent. You know, all of a sudden, a camel, sorry, he sticks his nose in over there, and he just wants to know if he can just stick his nose in. And we give you permission, yeah, yeah, you can, you, can, you can stick your nose in. And then pretty soon, he's got a foot in. And then pretty soon, he's got another foot in. And then pretty soon, you know, the whole hump comes in. And then pretty soon, you and I are out, and the tent is full of the camel. You know, and the, and the camel and the tent collapses. So, you know, we have to stand strong, all of us. And one of the things I want to emphasize today is Michigan, all of you business owners, you beauticians, you barbers, 
massage therapists, all of you, open up your shop. <laughs> Stand up and show up. Thank you. Say, my name is James Gray. I'm the gym, own, gym, gym owner in Genesee County that everyone was referring to that I opened up as well. I just want to say how honored I am to be standing alongside Carl and alongside Shelly. These people took the first initiative, they stepped up, they said we deserve these freedoms. We, we are born with the American spirit. We're not trying to put people in danger. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to provide for our families. And we're trying to encourage other people to do the same. So the route that I took with this uh, with this entire event is I'm going to look at all the information and I'm going to make sure that the story is accurate because I was raised with the idea that to take care of your immune system, you take care of your body, you take care of your mind, you go out, you work out, you get fresh air, you get in the sunshine, and all of these things were challenged. And that made no sense to me. So when I started looking at the information and it didn't add up, and I started looking at these inspirational figures, I said, we all need to stand up. Yep. Carl's leading the way, Shelly's leading the way, all of Michigan Woo! needs to stand up. Yeah! To open up. We need to show up. Yep. You couldn't have made it any more beautiful to, other than being that simple. Right. Don't make it complicated. Do the right thing. Let's get together, let's band together, let's not allow people that overreach their executive powers in this great nation to Woo! suppress us. Everybody in Michigan, now's your time. Open up your businesses. Stand up. Step up, stand up, open up, show up. Yeah. And I also want to speak just to the people that are living in fear, because I do know that there are countless people across this great state that are wonderful people, that are just afraid. And I want to be very clear that we shouldn't be attacking those people and shouldn't be going after them and making them feel bad for, for being crippled by fear. Fear is a powerful emotion. It shuts down logic, it shuts down the reasoning. So instead of looking at those people and being angry, because I'm very frustrated and I know many of you are, we need to look at those people with compassion. And the way that we can help them is get the information to those people. We need to band together, we need to focus on the information, and we need to steer this state, country, nation in the right direction. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you to people like Carl. I want to shake your hand. You're a wonderful human being. Thank you, Shelly. And I'm going to turn it over now to a doctor who this is truly his specialty because I could speak on the immune system, but not nearly as good as this gentleman could. So again, today we're asking you stand up, open up, show up. Let's go, Michigan. Yeah. Well, I've been asked to come address you all as a PhD research scientist scientist with a training in molecular biology. A lot of people ask me what my PhD is and I just say I dig post holes. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, just wanted to give you a couple quick things. Who's here? Help me out here. James? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. We're all news news right now. Live. All right, so how many of you have seen this graph that the governor likes always to refer to? Yeah, yeah number of cases. And number of deaths. That's the only two data pieces that we've had by the state of Michigan that she's constantly used to say this is science and data. Suppression of science! So, Fake news! <laughs> <laughs> the truth! So, um, one thing about cases is cases is only a reflective of a test that determines a positive result. So if we look at here, anybody, even if you don't know science, Here's our death rates, the total death accumulation that we have over time. Here's our total cases. 
I don't know, I don't need a PhD to understand that those two don't make sense. Something else is going on here. But we're going to continue to see this curve increase in the amount of cases for what reason? Because we're going to increase the amount of testing that we have happen across this, uh, across this state. So we're already seeing more and more cases simply because we're testing more and more people. And yet our death, death curve remains flat. The reason is because in between here is the asymptomatic people. And what we know about this disease is that it's as high as almost 88% of the people that test positive have no symptoms. So there's a number of quick cases of that. They did a New York Presbyterian Columbia University, tested all of the pregnant women that came in. They found that 15% of those women tested positive. 88% of those women had no symptoms whatsoever didn't even know they were positive. Now some would say, well that's the reason we've got a quarantine. But I'd turn it around and say if 88% of the people who are, po who are test positive don't have any symptoms, why are we locking up the healthy? That's right. So the other one here was just down at Pine Street Animal Homeless Shelter. They tested 400 people. 36% of them tested positive, but none of them had any symptoms. So this whole idea of asymptomatic, that a large percentage of the population is infected with coronavirus, but it has no symptoms. It's a Wimmer virus! Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, the last thing we know, which is really important and we need to protect, is the vulnerable population. So in Italy, um, the first 5,000 cases that they came out, and what did we find out? We found out that 79 and a half years was the average age of those dying. And in fact, 99.1% of everyone had pre-existing conditions. And then in Spain, 90% of the deaths are 70 years and older, average 74% uh, at underlying conditions. Florida, 83% of the people are over 65. In Michigan, the average age of death is 75. And the other factor that we know is about 40% of all the deaths nationwide are nursing home related. In some cases, it's more. Wayne County, it's 40% nursing home related. New Jersey, at one point, it was as high as 70%. So obviously we need to protect those that are vulnerable, that have underlying conditions, and to find ways that we can protect them more effectively. But the answer is not locking up those who have healthy immune systems. We gotta find a way to protect those that have the symptoms, but not by locking up everybody else in their home that's healthy. Let's look at the next one. So here's the thing about Michigan, is we rank 30 deaths, but we rank dead last in the amount of data. You've never seen this data presented in the state of Michigan. Only in the last couple weeks have we been able to get hospital data and yet no trend data. This graph here is the total amount of hospital patients, the blue line. Down here we have those in critical care in the origin. This is the ones on ventilator. The bottom is look at the death line. It's been consistent and steady throughout that. So if I look at this graph versus the other one, you've got a tale of two different data. One of them says that we've had a 70% reduction in the amount of COVID patients that have been hospitalized. Back in the peak, in April 9th, when she gave us our incredible, great executive orders where we couldn't buy paint and Gordon plants, we had 4,000 people in the hospital. 4,000 out of 25,000 beds in the state of Michigan. But in Detroit, we know 75% of our cases were there and that's where it was concentrated. But here's what we know across the state. Right now, in terms of the symptoms, you can put it down. So, 33% of the hospitals in the state, uh, hospital systems, we have 45 hospital systems. One third of those hospital systems have no COVID patients right now at all. There's another 28% of the hospital systems have one to 10 COVID patients. And all of the remaining 77 patients are concentrated in six hospital systems. Now let's look at the flip side and occupancy. We have about 23,500 beds in the state of Michigan. Right now, 40% of those beds are empty across the entire state of Michigan. 40%. If we look at some of the other hospitals, 42% of our hospital systems have less than 25% of their beds filled. Three quarter of hospitals are empty. Memorial Hospital here, 70% of their beds are empty. It's a staggering figure that's not been told. All of the hospitals have about 21 days supply of the personal protective equipment. So hospitalizations are going down, our hospitals are empty, 
You've heard about the layoffs. People are being laid off in the medical profession. Why? Because they can't do elective surgeries. People can't get the care. They can't get the cancer screenings. They can't get the knee surgeries. And yet our hospitals are empty. They don't have the COVID patients. Something doesn't add up, and it's time for Michigan to stand up. And it's time for Michigan to say, open up our hospitals and our clinics and let people get the care that they need. I want to talk real quickly, the last one, about not just the COVID patient, but the economic patient. That's the other statistics that we have, is the economic patient. We have 1.7 million that are unemployed here in the state of Michigan. We're 25% unemployment. All right, just rabbles what mirrors what we had in the Depression era. But here's a proud statistic for Michigan that the governor needs to own. It's the second highest unemployment rate in the nation. Right. Second to California. Our economy generates 530 billion or 30 million dollars in gross domestic product. The estimate billion dollars, 530 billion dollars. It's estimated that we're having a 40 to 50 percent economic loss right now in the state of Michigan. That means we're losing 500 to three quarters of a billion dollars every single day in a loss to our state economy. That's a sick patient. And that's all of us in the state of Michigan. It impacts the state budget. We're looking at a decrease of $2 billion in state tax revenue. Another $1.2 billion shortfall to our schools. We're seeing about 20 uh, two percent decrease in tax revenue, sixty percent decrease in casino revenue, which goes to schools. That's our case. That's our situation that we have in our state of Michigan. But it's a personal story. It's a personal story of Carl. It's a personal story of James. It's a personal story of others that you're going to hear about. Of Shelley, who said, "We can no longer sit down. We have to stand up. We have to open up for our economy, and we need the people in the communities to show up." Here's, we've heard of a second wave. Who's heard of the second wave? When did they plan that for? But let me tell you the second wave that's happening right now. We're staying, saying right here now, businesses need to open up in the state of Michigan. Businesses cannot go longer. It's not up to the governor to trickle out, even as she did today, uh, giving us permission, paroling us from our homes to go back and do certain things. Here's the real second wave that's coming. I've noticed it in the last week, a wave of announcements of business that says, we will not open up anymore. We're a permanent casualty in the state of Michigan. Look, yeah, this is what it is. This is the image of the second wave of casualties. These are the ones just in the last week that have been identified that are no longer an economic patient. They're an economic death in the state of Michigan. We should put this at half flag, or at least salute them. Town Tavern Restaurant, Royal Oak, Michigan. 13 years in business, 2007 to 2020. Big Cat Brewing Company, Cedar, Michigan. 14 years in business, 2014 to 2020. Contempo Salon, just talked to them this morning. Caledonia, Michigan. 25 years in business, 1995 to 2020. Livonia Family YMCA. Livonia, 60 years in business, 1960 to 2020. Michigan Maple Block Company, Petoskey, Michigan, 139 years in business, 1881 to 2020. Old Castle Dykter Glass, Burnups, Michigan, 50 years in business, the anchor business in Burnups, 1970 to 2020. Big Boy Coldwater in Coldwater, Michigan, 48 years in business, 1972 to 2020. Unique Boutique, Muskegon Shores, the Townsend Bankery, Birmingham, Michigan. 23 years baking in business, 1997 to 2020. Williams, Wilsma Restaurant in Ann Arbor, Cafe, nine years in business, 2011 to 2020. Walker Music, Textiles Company in Hastings, Michigan. If you've seen Steve Walker, I cried and I wept watching his video. And he said, this isn't about my business. This was my life dream that they've taken away from me. And he says, I don't want my hands tied, I want them untied so that I can work. This is the second wave of economic casualties. 
That's not the let, right let, right let, let me Let's say this. Let me say this. This is up to American communities. It's up to Michigan communities. It's up to Michigan businesses. We can open up safely. Yes. Yes. We know how to do this. Yes. We know how to do it in a way that's safe. Yes. And so the cry right now from all of these things, the cry from their grave is to say, please, Michigan communities, stand up, open up, and everyone in that community, show up. Amen. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Hello from the UP. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did anybody see the all business essential signs going along I-96 from Holland down to Detroit? Yeah. We brought them to you from the UP. Uh, my name is Eric Keelan and I own a business called New Focus Corporation. We make composite rebar, employ 20 people. And I also have another business called Superior Polymer Products where we employ 10 people. When the governor made her first announcement, I laid off 10 people immediately and watched a book of $600,000 in business disappear overnight. I looked at that for a bit, applied for the PPP. We were fortunate to get it, but now some four weeks into it, I'm looking around and saying, what am I going to do with this business because there's nothing going on and I'm seeing these extensions coming. After looking for it for a bit about three weeks ago on a, on a Sunday, I'm stomping through my house wondering why nobody says what I think. And I caught my reflection in the mirror. I said, I guess if not anybody else, it's you. So I decided at that time I would try to do something about it and started a GoFundMe campaign. We rapidly raised $10,000. I got on our local radio station and I asked for the opportunity to address the community to just see if everybody else in the community felt the same way. And I was just floored by the response. And uh, all of a sudden I found myself a campaign manager running, trying to run two businesses. We went to Superior Polymers. I talked to my nephew who runs that business, along with two other nephews, and I said, you guys want to go back to work? Everybody said, yeah. We called everybody back. Nine out of ten came back, and we decided to open up our business. We did it, I think it's three weeks ago, in outright defiance of Governor Whitner's demands. I'm proud to say that our local community stood out and supported us for doing that. And I find myself standing here today kind of stunned, quite frankly, wondering what I'm doing talking to everybody. Yeah. We've done some rebel rousing up in the UP, though. And I'm pleased to say that we had police officers in one of our local restaurants who opened this morning and this yeah. weekend. Woo! Yeah. Thank you. We have another business called The Rock House that opened to my family a small party of 50 on Friday night and was open all weekend. Yay! All right, so Governor Whitmer, I understand that today you took the opportunity to bless us with a partial opening of the UP. And I'm here to tell you that uh, that's not good enough. We're going to take it all. So again, everybody stand up, show up, support your local businesses. We do not need mandates to teach us how to live. All right? So there's one thing I'll leave you with. We have a First Amendment right. Yes, we do. All right? Someone help me with that. We, have, we can speak our mind. We can gather how we want to. We can go where we want to, as long as we do it peaceably. Yes. But you do have to have the courage to take it. Yes. And that's what I find lacking in this country. So please, stand up with us. Stand up with Carl. Woo! Thank you, Carl. Yeah. I appreciate you for doing that. James, thank you. Shelly, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Georges, and I am the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church. That is open for in-person worship. And I'm here just to encourage all our churches in the state of Michigan to stand up, to open up, and your people in the communities will show up. They're ready to get back to church. And the message the church needs to be preaching right now is faith over fear. And fear has been holding people down. And the un one of the other untold tragedies of this whole thing 
is the mental health and the spiritual crises that are being experienced by individuals all across the state of Michigan. We won't know what those cases are until they have the boldness or they are forced to come out of their homes finally to see the state that they are in. And they're going to turn to churches and the people of God to be able to stand up and give them the encouragement that they need that can only be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm here to encourage churches to open up safely. There is ways to do that. And it's the thing we ought to do because we ought to help those that need help the most. And we want to be an encouragement to you. If I can be a help to you, please reach out to me and we will help you have some ideas on how you can do that. But there's also the idea of our First Amendment. And the church stands on the very First Amendment. The First Amendment was written for the church. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. And it's our churches that should be leading this to charge to open up Michigan. And so stand up, open up, your people, the people of Michigan will show up. And we want to encourage churches to get it, to get it, get, get back going and to help the people. And now who you've been waiting for? Shelly Luther. Hi Michigan. I do have to say I've been here before. Um, my boyfriend grew up in Frankenmuth. And his dad and uh, uh, girlfriend still live in Frankenmuth. So uh, yes, we were excited to come and represent Carl, but we absolutely had to show up in this great state and show our face and say this is not okay. A lot of you are wondering um, why I stood up like this, me too. Um, I'm just, you know, a normal person. Um, I had 20 hairstylists working in my place. I was already a month behind on my mortgage. Um, they were behind on their mortgage. They couldn't feed their kids. And they said, you know, we got to go underground to people's houses because we, we don't want to get caught. And me, thinking I was doing the responsible thing, said, no, let me open up the salon. I can make it sanitary in there. We can create social distancing. We can make people wear masks. And I don't know if you know, but in order to get a barber or a hairstylist license, you have 200 hours of sanitation training. Yeah. 200 yeah. hours. So those people that you're bumping into at Walmart and are all over the place, nowhere near as clean as a salon would be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Salons should be the first things to open up after yeah, hospitals. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I believe all, all stores should open up. That's, I mean, if one, all should, right? There's no one better than the other. There's no non-essential, essential, right? But why does your governor think that it's okay to open up for marijuana, liquor sales? Can't you get an abortion? Right. Okay, so all of these things, but you cannot get your hair cut. What is wrong? We have, I have people in my shop, older ladies, that have disabilities. They cannot wash their own hair. A lady called and said, I, my hair has been washed in four weeks. Call us, unessential. Just tell that to the families and my hairdressers. Tell them their family and the people that they're taking care of, they're not essential. Tell them to their face instead of hiding in a building, Gretchen. Yeah. I'm wondering, so you guys had an election March 10th, right? Yeah. But then she put you in a state of emergency the same night? Yeah. So she put you in all that harm's way and then decided after that it was a state of emergency? That's greedy, Gretchen. Yeah, it is. How many people did you sacrifice to try to get in that VP seat, Gretchen? Tell them her. How many people? Also, you're very reactive and not proactive like a governor should be. How did you help your nursing homes? What PPE did they get? None, not the caretakers, not the people, they got nothing. This blood is on your hands. Do not blanket an entire state on lockdown for your mistakes. 
they are not to blame. This is all you. Yeah. And all you can do to fix this is open up. Ah, open yeah. up. Yeah. Stop yeah. being a tyrant. Yes. Open yeah. up. And you don't get this control. We control you. We have the power. Yeah. We vote you out. Yeah. Richard, the state of Michigan will vote you out. Yeah. I'll be open tomorrow. Yeah.